And it's a fascinating book. In fact, I love the whole Bible, but I love the book of Genesis. And I love the book of Acts. I don't know why those two just, they fascinate. Because I think probably in one way, they're stories about people, aren't they? They're stories about people. In the book of Acts, you see people that get it wrong and make mistakes. You see that through the book of Genesis. But I, I get encouraged because what I see is I read the stories in the book of Genesis and I read the book of Acts. I see people that are not perfect. In fact, some of them have done bad things, but God still uses them. I want to encourage you on that because sometimes we can look at our own lives and think, oh, God could never use me. You know, I've done this or I've got this. I want to encourage you that if you truly read the Bible, you'll see that God uses all sorts of people. He doesn't tend to use the religious, the the so-called righteous, perfect people. He uses people like you and me. He takes us. I mean, Gideon is an example of a young man that God chose to use. There's so many stories in the Bible. And we see the story of Abraham as we, as we continue the study of Abraham. We see that Abraham, the Bible talks about the father of faith, this great man of faith, but he got it wrong so many times, didn't he? He got it wrong, but God still used him. God had a plan for his life. We, look at, we looked at the story of Moses and he wasn't a perfect man, but God used him. And I want to encourage you. You may look at your life. And you may think, well, God could never use me. He can use you, all right? He uses us despite our mistakes and things that we get wrong. And so we've looked at the beginning of the story of Abraham. Abraham met and fell in love with Sarai, who came Sarah. They did have children, but the first child they had was Ishmael. The second one was what? Isaac. And so about Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, and that's a love story in itself about how they met. It was like an arranged marriage, but they fell in love. Two of the first sons, who can remember the two sons? Anyone? I'm testing you here. What were their names? Esau and Jacob, yeah? And they had these two sons that were quite an odd pair of twins. They, they fought in their mother's womb. They were having fights, and she's going, what if? I've never been pregnant, all right? You'll be pleased to know that. But I, I remember feeding Kathy's tummy as our boys got bigger and bigger. You mums out there will probably remember this. And suddenly you'd get this, this butterfly and movement in your tummy, you know. And, uh, oh, well, that's weird. <laughs> but these two were fighting. Something was going on, you know. God gave a prophetic word about how these two boys that were going to be gone would become nations and one would serve the other. And, it was all prophetic. But I don't want to focus that on the moment. I do want to look at these two boys. I want to look at Esau, who was born first. Can anyone remember any characteristic about Esau? What was it that made him different to other boys and babies that were born? Can anyone remember? He was a ginger. Well, red. Actually, the Bible says he was red. That sounds like a ginger to me. Yeah? And uh, up for the gingers. <laughs> He was, he was covered in a fur of jet red or ginger, all right? And he was born first, but as he was born, the second one was coming out, but he was holding the foot of Esau, and the second one was going to be called what? Jacob. And so these two boys born. And I want to go to chapter 25 of the book of Genesis, starting from maybe verse 27. And this is where they've been born, and they're growing up. Interesting thing here also, just to say this, that there was a prayer involved in this because Rebecca was barren. I mean, she couldn't conceive children. And a miracle happened. There was prayer, and she did conceive, and these two boys were the result. And it says in verse 27, so the boys grew. It's amazing how quickly our children grow, don't they? If you've got children, I mean, I still remember my boys this big, this big, at Sunday, you know, looking at Mel. I look at Isaac, <laughs> how tall is he? Yeah, they grow so quickly, don't they? I have to look up at both my boys. I know that's not difficult. <laughs> Most people are taller than me, but I still have to look up at them. They grow so quickly. And if you've got young children, can I say to you, enjoy every moment, every moment, because they do grow so quickly. 
I'm, and I'm being sentimental here. I used to love opening my front door after a day at work and they'd come running up to me, daddy, 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 and put their arms on. Oh, anyone getting sentimental? But I, I love that. Absolutely love that. But these, it says these two boys grew. And it says of their characters and what they did that Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Okay? And if, don't you find that also amazing how different our children are to one another? Andrew, my younger son, and Daniel are so different in their character, the way they look. One looks like Kathy, one looks like me. But in their character and the way they are, they're so different. It's amazing with babies. You, you see their character from very early on, don't you? And it became very, diff- very obvious that these two boys had very different characters. So Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob, Jacob was a mild man. So he's probably a bit of an in, introvert, a bit sensitive. And God created them both. No one personality. I love introverts. I love extroverts. All right? Sometimes I'm a bit of both. But God's created us all uniquely. We all have our own personalities. And God can use our personalities for his kingdom. And so Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac, that's the father, Isaac, loved Esau because he ate of his game. In other words, Esau would provide lovely cooked steak for Isaac. He loved that, yeah, because he was a hunter. But it says then, it says, Rebecca loved Jacob. So she loved the sensitive boy. I I do find that a bit puzzling, really, because I, I don't know about you, but I love my boys. I love my children equally, you know? I don't differentiate. Well, I don't see any difference in my love towards them. But here, they had favourites, and clearly, Rebecca loved Jacob. Verse twenty-nine. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Now, Jacob, right? He's the one that was the more sensitive boy, more of an introvert. Okay, he didn't go out hunting for food. Now, Jacob cooked a stew. And Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. All right, he'd been out there hunting. He was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew. He was hungry. He wanted food. And he saw this red stew. And therefore, his name was called Edom, or Edom. But Jacob said, this is the younger brother, said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what? What is the birthright to me? And then Jacob said, swear to me on this day. So he swore to him. In other words, he made a commitment to him. Okay. And sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and a stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In those days, a birthright was for the firstborn. So the firstborn would receive. Remember, Esau was first, even though Jacob was hanging on to his ankle, his his foot, he he was the firstborn. And so he was entitled to more than half of all the wealth that came from his father. Probably two thirds, three thirds of all the wealth would go to him. He had that right as the firstborn. But he gave it away because he was hungry and he wanted something to eat. He wanted what? He wanted instant gratification because he was hungry. And many years ago now, and if you, you might have been here, about 15 years ago, I showed a short video. I think it was when we were in Concordia Hall. And it was about a video about what happened in the early 70s called the marshmallow test. Did any of you remember that video or have any of you seen the marshmallow test? It's a very well-known test where they took very young children, three, four, five years old, and they put them into a classroom, each on their own, and they put a marshmallow on a plate in this room. And they said to the children individually, we're going to go out the room for a while. It's going to be 15 minutes. That's how they timed it. You can eat the marshmallow if you want, but if you can hold on and not eat that marshmallow, all right, when we come back, we're going to give you far more. We're going to give you pretzels. We're going to give you this. But 
only on the condition that you don't eat this marshmallow. All right? This is a test that was actually carried out. I think it was about 40 or 50 children. And the videos are fascinating, really fascinating. The camera's on them, and you can see them, the, the, the adult goes out, and you can see these children looking at this marshmallow. But knowing if they can hold on for a while, they're going to get so much more than just that one marshmallow. But that lovely, tasty, oh, marshmallow is looking at them. And that's why it's called the marshmallow test. And these videos are fascinating when you look at the behavior of the children. Some of the children, as soon as the adult was out of the room, grabbed that marshmallow and it was straight in their mouth. Others struggled. They knew if they held on, they would get so much more. One child knew, wanted what was much more, but oh, if I could just taste that marshmallow. So she picked up the marshmallow, licked it, and put it back down, you know? And others sniffed it, and others tried to close their eyes, and others tried to pin their nose seats just so they could last for these few 15 minutes so they could get more. But many of the kids took that marshmallow straight away. And they did, did that test, and then years and years later, they looked at those children to see what came of their life. And this is called, you know, it's, it's the marshmallow test. And it's been slightly debunked now, and I'll tell you why that in a minute. But what they, what they found was, in the, in the, what they did, was that many of the children that had wanted instant gratification didn't do so well in life. Because they had to have that, and that, that thing in them that, I want it now, I want it now, that's it, I'm having it. It's been slightly debunked now because they've done a bigger survey, but they did find one thing that was true in that, that many of the children that took the marshmallow quickly, didn't wait, suffered later on in life with health problems and obesity and so forth because they didn't have the willpower just to hold on and delay that gratification. It's interesting, isn't it? And it's like our lives can be like that sometimes. We, 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 we want it now, we want it now, we're going to have it now to get the consequences. But if we'd only hold on, if we'd only wait, if Esau had only waited, he, he was, just wanted his tummy filled, okay? He was weary to get his birthright, but he was going to pay the penalty of that years later. He, he would lose his birthright. In fact, he would lose more than that. But that's another story for another time. Esau sold his birthright. Do you know, never in history, never in history have we ever lived in a time when we can have instant gratification for anything, really. Never, you know, you remember the old thing, buy it now, pay later. I mean, that's just the start of it. I mean, that's around since I was a kid, you know. Oh, yeah, you can buy this £1,600 sofa. Don't pay anything now. Start paying in one year's time. You know? That's just the start. L listen to what it says here. I just want to read this, this um, insight out to you. It says, in the digital age of instant gratification, or instant gratification has taken root, particularly among the young people, this pervasive culture of seeking quick pleasures has far-reaching consequences, especially in the realm of pornography. One of the books in the Bible says about wisdom and about delaying those things. We need to understand the dangers of chasing and seeking instant gratification. It's everywhere in our society today. I said particularly amongst the young people. They can have things straight away. Who remembers TV when it was two channels? I'm showing my age now. Two channels. What was it? ITV, BBC, wasn't it? Then we got, what did we get next? BBC Two, wasn't it? And then Channel Four. And we thought we, we were the bee's knees. We had four channels now. And of course, God, I'm really showing my age. Who remembers when we transitioned from black and white TVs to colour TVs? Yeah? But even then, it was great, but even then you still had to get up off your sofa and change the channel. Who remembers that? And the big thing it was that when we got the remote control, suddenly we could sit on our sofa and go, oh, yeah, I don't want to watch that. We have four channels to choose from. But now how many channels do we have? Amazon, Netflix, Disney, all these channels available to us. That's just three of them, you know? And we can just sit on our sofa. Life is so easy. 
We don't even have to get off our chair now to change the channel. We don't even have to get off our chair to turn it on or turn it off. If it is getting even better now, you don't even have to use the remote. You get it all wired up professionally. You can say, turn the TV off, turn the TV on, go to channel five. Does it all for you? Instant gratification. It's so many, so many areas of our life. <laughs> I've never done this, all right? It's only what I hear other people talk about. But apparently there's this app, I'm not going to promote it, right? Where you can look for a partner and you can swipe left or you can swipe right. So easy. There's no developing of a relationship, no getting to know people. It's just about looks. Oh, yeah, I fancy him. Oh, yeah, she looks nice. Oh, I don't know whether you can find it. Who sw- when, how do you swipe? Right for yes? Or yes or no, I don't know. But life has become everything. It's instant gratification. Everything. So, so challenging in so many ways that we don't have to wait for anything so we don't grow, we don't mature. It says here, let me read this to you. It says that by reflecting on scripture, men and women can gain the strength to overcome the destructive cycle, instant gratification, embracing patience, self-control, get me a glass of water, and a pursuit of higher values. Remember, the pursuit of immediate pleasure may seem enticing, but it often leads to emptiness and dissatisfaction. In Galatians chapter 5, it says this, But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other. You see, it's all about our flesh at the moment. It really is all about our flesh and our desires and what, what we can actually have. But I do thank you. I do believe that we're missing out. This generation is missing out on so much because we don't wait for that thing to mature. We don't wait for this to mature and understand. You know, in relationships, getting to know people, you know, if you're looking for a partner, realising it's not just about the looks, it's about who that person is and what they're like. It's, these things are so important, so important to us all. But we live in instant days of instant gratification. Think about this. When did instant gratification begin? Where did it start? I'll tell you, it started in the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Well, not chapter 1, it's chapter 3, I think, isn't it? But this idea that they can know good and evil by just gratifying their desire for this fruit that looks so nice. And so the story of mankind began, that man gave over to instant gratification. I can be just like good God. I can eat this fruit that looks so nice. That's where it all began. I've written down here four things that I think we need to be honest about our own lives and where we, we've allowed instant gratification to take over. The four areas, and I'm not doing them in order of priority, I'm just thinking about these things. Food. We can have whatever we want. Never has there been a time in human history where you can just go to a supermarket and get all this food. Where you can go to McDonald's and get a really tasty, Kathy hates McDonald's, but I love McDonald's, a really tasty burger and chips and that instantly virtue. But what that's led to, that has led to obesity, gluttony. You know, there's an epidemic in the world of people that are ill now because of overeating. And what is that based on? It's like based on this idea, I want instant gratification. I want instant gratification. I want it now. And so food. Jesus was tested on this. We know the story in the wilderness when Jesus is there being tested by Satan. So how did Satan test him? What was one of the tests that the devil used? What was it? Can you think of one to do with food? Yeah, that's right. The devil said to him, you're hungry. You've been fast, uh, you know, fasting in the desert. Look, look at that stone. Turn it into bread. Eat. He said, man does not live on bread alone. So food can be an area where we fall into the trap of instant gratification. I'm hungry, just as Esau, and I want that food. And in a way, if we're not careful, by us fulfilling instant gratification in regards to food, we could be selling our birthright. 
we may not li live as long as we want to live, all right? We may be ill before we should be ill. This is not me saying this. This is what the medical world says if you're obese, if you're overweight. I know people say to me, oh, you don't understand, Glenn, it's medical. Well, yes, I understand. But, you know, what goes in <laughs> has a lot to do with it. So be careful with food because it is a gluttony, you know, and it can lead to obesity, etc., and ill health and maybe even an early death. The other one I put down is drugs. Now, this, I might not take this quite how you think I'm going to take it, but um, yes, drugs, instant gratification. You know, people that are in a dark place in this world, they're going through difficult things, that maybe taking a drug makes them feel better. Maybe it does. But there's always a sting, isn't there? There's always a sting. But can, another thing, and I found this really interesting, I was reading another study about this, that because of our desire in this day and age for instant gratification, we want instant healing. So what do we do? We take antibiotics. And now, I'm not anti-antibiotics, anti right? but they are being overused with some people because they want instant gratification. They, want, they don't want that, that. They don't want their body to take time to heal itself. They want that dealt with now. And so, again, we have this situation where, yes, drugs can be addictive and they can destroy your life. How many people with so much potential in their life, so much to go forward with, die early? And we've lost friends that have overdosed, OD. We've lost friends who did that. How many lives and destiny have been lost because of the misuse of drugs? And, of course, now, the problem with antibiotics, because everyone's been using them for instant healing in a sense. Now, don't get me wrong. I said, don't get me wrong. I'm not on that, that march of anti antibiotics. But they are, they're recognizing there's a problem that too many antibiotics are being given out, that the viruses or germs, whatever they are, are becoming immune to those things. And the other thing I've put down here is things. Instant gratification. I want it. I want it now rather than delayed gratification. That's the other word I want you to remember. Esau wanted that strip. He wasn't going to wait. And we have to be careful that we don't think because the world says we can have everything now, we can, when sometimes it's a good idea to wait. You know, with things, you know, I can have the best car, just get it on finance. I can have the best TV, I'll just get it on finance. Rather than saving being a good steward of your money and saving up for those things, all right? We've got to be careful of those traps. Now, again, I'm not saying, please don't put me in a box. And I'm not saying there are times when you do need finance to get through, a mortgage, for example, or maybe you need a good car for work and you need a, a, a certain car, and maybe that's how you have to do it. But for the majority of us, saving is a key. Jesus talks about this. He talks about it in the parables. How important it is. Who's heard of compound interest? You must have heard of compound interest. Being the next banker. <laughs> I think it was Einstein, okay, who said, now I can't remember if it was the second or fifth wonder of the world, but that compound interest is, is one of the wonders of the world. How it works. How interest compounding on interest compounding on interest. It, it's a, if you haven't looked at that, it's fascinating. I wish I'd known the science behind compound interest when I was in my 20s and I'd saved more. If you're in your 20s or 30s now, you need to study it. You need to know it because it can set you in a really good place as you come to retirement and so forth. Compound interest. But we want to spend it now. We want to have those things now. And what happens also is that we take money, we borrow money to get the things that we are not willing to wait for. And then what happens is later down the road, those things, we're out, we, get, we want something else, but we can't afford it anymore. Why? Because we spent the money buying it for a loan and we're paying the loan off still. So we have to be careful. Good judgment. Delayed gratif gratification is so important. Hmm. I, um, as, again, as I, I, I looked at scripture on this, I, 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 sent, I said to myself, that we need to be wise in the things of, or, or, of the things the world offers us at the moment. We need to be wise because it can set a trap in our lives. 
I want each one of you to be all that God wants you to be. All right? I don't want any of you falling ill, okay? Because you've allowed instant gratification to rule your life in whatever area. I want you to be free. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Yeah, we're free from the power of sin and death, but free from the traps that the enemy would place in our way. We need to be free, free from those things. There's an old blues song, and I think it's called uh, I Sold My Soul to the Devil. Who remembers that, the old blues song, and about the crossroads and stuff like that? And I think it's about, you correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not into the music that, but it's about he wanted to play the guitar better, didn't he, or whatever, and he made a deal with the devil or something like that. I sold my soul to the devil. Don't sell your soul. Don't sell your calling. Don't sell your gifts. Don't sell your life to the devil, to the things of this world. Apostle Paul said, leave those things behind you. Go for that which is good. Focus, focus on God. Focus on him. Because the world will tell you you can have everything and you can have it now. It's easy. That's as the devil told Adam and Eve. Eat of this fruit now and you'll be just like God. Instant gratification. Do not fall into that trap. So, Father, I just lift up everybody in this room now. Thank you for your word, Lord. That for each one of us, we will be free from every trap of the enemy. Give us wisdom. Give us your grace. Give us the grace to say no when we need to say no, Lord. Give us the grace to say no, I'm waiting. Help each one of us, Lord, to be set free from the traps that the enemy has set in place. Where our flesh so much wants those things, give us the grace to be able to say, no, I will wait. Pray for every person in here, Lord. They would reach the fullness of what you want for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. I hope that's helped you today to think at least about these things, to think about gratification. Am I willing to wait or do I have to have it now? Jesus waited. Use him as your example. Amen.